Welcome back to the Tapes Archive Podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we have the Who's frontman, Roger Daltrey. At the time of this interview in 1994, Daltrey was 50 years old and was promoting his upcoming concert, Daltrey Sings Townsend. In the interview, Daltrey talks about whether he feels competitive with bandmate Pete Townsend, why the Who struggled to make more albums, how anger changes with middle age, and why the Who rarely did encores. This week's interview is hosted by Mark Allen. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. Hello, Roger. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good. Good, good. Um, well, since we have a short time, I'll get right to it. Um, I, I was in on the uh, conference call a couple of months back when you did the uh, the Carnegie Hall show, and uh, it was interesting to me that not one person asked about your solo records, so I'm going to start out by asking about that. Uh, do you feel like you've gotten your due? I mean, I think you've, you've had some real fine records in, in, uh, you as a solo artist. Well, I got what I wanted to do out of it is, is I'm, I made the music I wanted to make. Um, whether they were commercially successful or what, I mean, that's, to me, is not really why I do it. I'm not complaining. Okay. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. I, it would have been nice to have more success than I actually had, but I, I think people find it very difficult to accept band members that have been in a band like The Who uh, uh, for that length of time in, in, in a different capacity. I think I think they find it very difficult to accept that. I think we all suffer from it. Pete suffers from it as, as well to a certain extent. Yeah, no, no question about it. There are a couple of uh, uh, things that, that stand out in my mind as, as solo recordings of yours, and that would be uh, some of the stuff on the Mick Vicker soundtrack and uh, Under a Raging Moon in particular. Um, are, do, are there standout things for you? Yeah, I was really pleased with my last album, Rocks in the Head. Yeah, I mean, that, that one too. It was a real writing breakthrough for me. Uh, I was very pleased with that. Um, but yeah, I'm proud of both those uh, records. I'm proud of everything I've done. You know, they're all done with different reasons. I, I was always trying to do different things. I mean, sometimes I feel flat on my face, but it, it's the trying that's important. Now, you said that, that you think people have a hard time accepting it. Why is that, do you think? I mean, are they just so used to seeing you with the Who that they can't take it with uh, anybody else? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's the same. Uh, what can I say? It seems to be everything about this industry now wants to pigeonhole you. And it seems that audiences have become almost the same thing. You know, they want you in that box or they don't want you at all. So when I sat down, I thought, well, I'd like to, go, you know, I really still want to sing. I still want to get out there. But, but the economics of touring and doing something different, are, it, it's very difficult. So I thought, well, let's give people what they want. They want to hear me singing Who songs. I'm the guy that sang them in the first place. I can make it sound like The Who if I want to, very, very easily, you know. I can make it sound exactly like The Who. In fact, when John's with me on a few of the shows, Pete's brother's with me. I could even call it Townsend, Daltrey and Entwistle, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it, that's not the point. It's, it, it's, it's making it, uh, taking it on, you know, make, make the music live and, 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 and push it on a bit. And what's great about Who music, especially the, the post-Tommy stuff or Tommy and, and after, is that when you hear it played with an orchestra and it works, I mean, well, I've only done it twice, the Carnegie Hall things, and the, the first night was a nightmare, complete nightmare. But the second night it came together and it worked. It was, it really is an amazing sound. And it, and it really does feel like the orchestra always should have been there. It doesn't take away from the sound at all. It, when you hear it, it, it's just so dramatic, the effect, that it, it makes every hair on your body stand up when it's working. Given what you said about being a solo artist, did, did you have any uh, trepidation about going out on the road with something like this, which is very expensive and might not pay off? Oh, I'll worry about that when it comes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't worry for myself so much because, I mean, I, I've done well out of this industry and I worry about the guys in the bank because they, 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 it's their bread and butter. Um, but I, it's, it's, it's a great show. And like I say... The, the Who, I would love The Who to be out there playing this summer. I would love The Who to have a record out there uh, and be the group that I've always felt that it should be and should never have stopped being. But it's not because Pete doesn't want to do it. And this is the ne next thing I can do that will keep this music alive because Who music doesn't just live on the radio. I mean, that's what we did 20 years ago, 25 years ago. It's still vibrant today when you hear it played live. But, it, I can only, but there's very few people that play it. And no one, I don't think anyone plays it better than myself and the other guys in the band. So I'm being the voice, I'm out there doing it. I'm going to be out there doing it. Is it 
still comfortable to sing those songs? I mean, I know you still love This is hard as shit. I'm sorry? It's as, it's as, it's as hard as hell. It's, oh, okay. it's a, it, it crucifies me every night, but that's, what, that's why it was always so great. You know, it was the struggle to make it. Those songs are, are created out of, of interior agonies. And, and you can't go through the motions on those songs ever. Right, and that's true. And and also, I think those songs are very geared toward youthfulness, youthful rebellion, antagonism, and all that. And uh, I don't, I don't necessarily. I think they were written with that, but I think there's something that they gain from middle age because anger changes in middle age. You still, you're still passionate, but anger, it, it, it's not so much anger anymore. It's it's bigger. It's a bigger canvas, not a smaller one. And I think it's more, in some ways, more more relevant. Because my energy hasn't dropped at all. And I still think I'm in the same keys. I mean, it's still the same, you know. Just because it, isn't, it hasn't got the, the kind of ignorance of youth, if you like, I mean, you, you can never get that back. You, a lot of your innocence goes out the window, and along with your ignorance, and, and it changes you. And anger, anger becomes something else. I wish I could find a word for it. I've, I've thought about it an awful lot, but it's, it's definitely not anger anymore, although it's not any less passionate. But it's something bigger. This is certainly a lot less destructive. Yeah. <laughs> In the uh, Playboy interview that Pete did not long ago, he said that he always felt a competition with you, that he was on stage and he was really trying to vie for the attention and the affection of, of the audience uh, against you. Did you feel that too? No, I never did. I, was all, I always wanted to be a band member and do my bit in the band. I didn't really care about things like that. I mean, it's obviously a singer, a singer stuck up the front whether he likes it or not. It's not the easiest job in the band, but to me it was never really a competition. I used to like the, the friction between us creatively because I, I used to feel that Pete's biggest problem in, in life used to be the kind of sycophantical attitude adopted by people around him, but which I think in the end do him no favours whatsoever. Um, telling people what, what they want to hear isn't necessarily always the best thing. I used to be very good at telling what he, telling, telling him sometimes what he didn't want to hear. And I think he respected me for that. Did, did you know he was... I'm not to say, that's not to say that I was always right. Yeah. But it made him think. Did you know he was competing with you? I always got the feeling by his interviews, it was they always shocked me where he's sometimes coming from, you know. They, they still do. I mean, I still... I still feel that he, he, he's almost in who denial. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I find that very sad because I know he wrote some wonderful, wonderful songs. I wonder if he would have wrote, wrote those songs had he had not been in a band like The Who or even the band The Who. So I think it's a shame he can't just give The Who some credit where it's deserved because a lot of great books have been written and have never been read. And, and it's the same with music. If you look at the history of Tommy, for instance, when it first was released, it wasn't. It was a. It was a fair hit. It wasn't a big, big hit. It was a hit after the Who had gone out and slogged their balls out on the road for two or three years and got it back in the charts and made it the huge hit that it became. That's not just the writer. That's the band. <laughs> yeah. So speculate on it. Why? Why is he the way he is about the Who? I can't speculate on ever on what Pete is. He never, you know, he's a, he's a guy that is very, very complex. I, I do love him very dearly. I don't like him a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love him very, very dearly, and I, I couldn't ever hope to analyze him. There was a um, New York Times magazine piece not long ago that was kind of looking at the Who and, and saying that there are actually more Who uh, greatest hits and repackages than there are original material. Uh, oh, it's true. Yeah, um, never before has, has, has so so little been produced so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, why was that? I mean, was it was it just a constant struggle to try to get things done? It was very very difficult in the studio with us because Pete wanted wanted control all the time, and it became more and more difficult as it went on. And we were always on the road. And then we got then we got into film projects and grandiose ideas of. of you know, producing films and all this kind of stuff, and it kind of took away from the, what we really did well, was, which was to make records. And we did it well. When we did it well, we did it as well as it can be done, you know. Let me ask you something else about the, about the Who. The, um, it, I've always felt that, that Ant Whistle's contributions were the least recognized and, and that he really got a, a pretty raw deal as far as you know, if people oh. listened and, and, and analyzed what the Who did, that Ant Whistle was a huge part of it. 
Can you talk about that? Oh, I, I wouldn't say he got... I, I mean, I, 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 I would agree with you that he... he, he I, I think all of us, uh, uh, the other three members, apart from Pete, I don't know whether any of us really got the credit we deserved inside the hood. Look how much we suffered at the loss of Keith. We struggled on, but it was never... I mean, it... it we didn't do any... You know, we lost much, much more than just a drummer. And it's the same with John. I mean, he's he's on the road... With, he's coming on the road with me, and, and, and there's chemistry that he brings with him, that, that when he gets with me and we play together, there's a, there's a magic that comes out of out of nowhere. That's one thing the Who had in, in, in bundles. We had this chemistry that you can't hear on the records. So I think recording-wise, we, in the actual sound, not the, the, the content of the stuff, in the actual sound, was always very mediocre to what the sound was, and, 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 or what appeared to be the sound on stage because we had such incredible chemistry. And people used to be, be looking literally at magic because you're not looking at anything really tangible. There's something created by the chemistry between the four of us that is you have to see it to realize understand what it is is that apparent to you when you're on stage too it was always apparent to me in the who i, I mean i haven't done enough solo work to answer that question i've done the carnegie hall things like i said which was a real challenge to do and i'm really proud that i did it and pulled it off i mean it's a real off the wall thing to do i mean to have the chieftains playing barbara o'reilly with a rock group behind them and <laughs> the orchestra behind that you know it was a real kind of mad thing to do but it works you know and I'm really proud of that but I haven't done enough work solo work to, to know whether that that is still happening um, I, I would hope it is I'll keep my, keep my legs crossed that it is anyway <laughs> um, when you were on uh, the David Letterman show a couple of months back you um, with the spin doctors behind you I mean that was just that, that was as powerful as, as uh, you know just about anything as powerful as the who and oh sure they're a great band they, yeah. you know they, they remind me so much of how it used to be and it, and, and, and it was wonderful to play with them to be just to be reminded of where, where I come from because I mean you know it's like it, Everything in life, you you can uh, you, you do. Time seems seems to make you take a a lot for granted, unless you're constantly reminded on where you've been. You know, that's why I can't get to get to grips with all these people that have plastic surgery all the time. You know, it's be very strange looking in a mirror and continually looking like you were when you were nineteen. You know. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about the the show. Are people going to see something uh, markedly different from the Carnegie Hall show? Well, I mean, it'll be. It'll, it'll be all me, of course. Right. No, no, no guest stars. Um, we're doing some other songs. The Carnegie kind of Hall was very difficult for me because I had to give a lot of my best songs to the guest stars. It, it, I, I was acting as an MC. I couldn't get warmed up. It was it was hard. But generally, this will be. I think there'll be more of a rock and roll set within this orchestral piece, you know, and also an acoustic set, which is nice. We had a time problem at Carnegie Hall because of the guest stars, which were, which were there because I wanted to make it a a celebration of Pete which it wouldn't have been if I'd just done it on my own I wanted other people to do that to sing his songs because he's been so little covered I mean there's been very very few covers of Pete's songs what did he say to you after those shows not a lot really? <laughs> happy birthday yeah <laughs> uh, but nothing uh, nothing really friendly he, got, he sent me a very nice telegram afterwards saying that you know that you know because the reviews weren't kind to us I mean most of the reviewers were there on the first night and um, because of the union problems at Carnegie, we didn't get set up until the evening. We were supposed to have a rehearsal in the afternoon, which was one of the few rehearsals we had with the orchestra. And we were denied that because of the, the time the unions took to set up. And uh, so the first show, was, was we were totally winging it. Now, it's easy to wing it when you've got like, a five-piece band, but you try winging it with 80 people on the stage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I struggled, but I mean, personally... It doesn't worry me that, you know, I don't have to prove that I can sing. Singers have a good night and they have bad nights. You know, so I had a bad night. That doesn't worry me. Surely, uh, to me, what is important is that to, uh, if I was in the audience, I would much rather watch anyone struggling and, and trying to achieve and occasionally getting it right, but fighting all the way, than watch someone else doing it no perfect and going through the motions, you know? To me, it's much more important. The struggle, in, especially in rock music, is, is much more important than the, than the end of the journey. So the show that you'll bring on the road, you think will be uh, a, a bit better, a bit tighter, like that? Or, or... Oh, much, much tighter. Yeah, okay. And I mean, we, we, Carnegie Hall is notoriously bad for sound. 
notoriously bad. I mean, you, you couldn't pick a worse place for sound to put anything electric in. I mean, in the kind of venues we'll be playing on this tour, it, we, everything is mic'd. We'll be able to get a, a brilliant sound. You know, we'll be able to take the sound up and make it much more funky. Did you know that you were going to take this out on the road, or was it just no. kind of a snap decision after? So, the second night of Carnegie went so well, I just thought we, this is something we could work and make work really well on the road. And I think it's a show people will come to and have a really good time at. Mm. Uh, getting back to the, the question I was asking about the spin doctors, you could. I, I wondered if you ever thought about, you know, what, I'll just get a, a you know three member rock band behind me and, and go out and really do this. You know, I want to do the Who stuff. If Pete doesn't, fine, but I'll get something and try to recreate it as best I can. I mean, I thought of all those things, but I mean. That would just be copying what the Who do. I think what's great about doing it with an orchestra and doing it the way we're doing it at the moment is that it is something a little bit more than that. And you really do have to hear it working well to understand what I mean. Has there been any, any talk of uh, the Who play in Woodstock 94? No, there's not at all. Okay. Pete doesn't want to do anything anymore. I don't, you know. Yeah, um, just a couple other things, and I'll let you go. Uh, you told the story on Letterman of how you started spinning the, the microphone. Could you retell it again? I, I've forgotten what the, the gist of it was. It was, it was, oh, I can't remember that. I, I, did, I don't think I told that story. I just told, told a story. I just I started spinning it out of boredom. That, that was it. Just, uh, yeah. just started doing it out of boredom. Okay. If for another story I'm working on, do you listen to a lot of uh, a lot of what's contemporary today? You listen to a lot of... Uh, I haven't for the last few weeks because I've been rehearsing so much. Yeah, but uh, okay. I, I keep in touch. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, are there, uh, if, if music were like the stock market and you could invest in some up-and-coming young band or bands, have you heard anything that uh, we have... That, that you like you think will be big or do well i've heard some good things lately I, I wouldn't like to put my money on anything at the moment <laughs> <laughs> the way the music business is so bloody corporate it is it's so much different than it was when we came up in it i don't really understand it anymore i mean when we, we came up in it it was any, anything you could do to help another artist you do and you did it was camaraderie it seems to me today it's, it's the camaraderie of the bank balance you know <laughs> which is very strange yeah, it, does that ever make you want to say, ah, forget about it, let me just, you know, sit back and rest and uh, enjoy my no, life? No, fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, don't fuck them, I want to keep singing. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing all the time I can, you know. I've still got a good voice when, I, when it's right. I can still holler with the best of them. Mm. And I'm a rock singer. Do you, do you ever go see any of your uh, your contemporaries from the 60s, 70s like that? Do uh, you ever go see them in concert anymore? Well, it's not a lot. Of, I mean, there's a few of them about, but yeah. I, I hope to catch the Floyd bomb out there, and I hope to catch uh, the Stones when they go out. So I played a Mick Ronson benefit the other night, and there was a few guys from, from the 60s, you know, William the Poor Boys was on, and uh, Gary Booker from Poker Harlem was on. It was nice to see those guys. You know, in 1974, I saw The Who for the first time, um, Quadrophenia, and I thought, and I can still remember a lot about that concert, and it's just an incredible memory. And I wonder if, if you know, there are going to be a lot of people like me in the audience that, that when you're here and we're, when you're everywhere, uh, are, do you worry about uh, the possibility of you know that they're that they're going to be disappointed? I don't see why they should. I, I mean, just come with an open mind. If, if you want it to be the same, you'll be disappointed because it won't be. I'm, I think I'm singing better than I've ever sang. Really? I okay. think the, the, this band is as tight as anything. This is an incredibly tight band. And, and I, I got to ask you why. So, but it depends what you want. If you want, if you want someone jumping up and down like Pete Townsend and another one on the drums playing the drumsticks like Mooney, you ain't going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've got Pete's brother who plays great rhythm guitar. He sings a very similar voice to Pete. I've got Zach Starkey on drums. Brilliant young drummer. Ringo's son. I hear those great songs again played live, and I tell you, they sound much better live than they do on the record. And uh, is there anything you want me to tell people about you or the show or anything else that we haven't talked about? Like I said, just come with an open mind. Okay. And, and finally, i got to ask you one thing. Uh, the night that I did see this uh, Who show in 74 at Madison Square Garden, uh, you didn't do an encore, and I guess the Who are famous for not doing encores. Was there a particular reason for that? Yeah, our encores were always shitty. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Is that why? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, you always got an on if you ever got an encore, you'd get it asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> why was that? Because we, we all gave it all out in a show. If you give a good, that good show out, you've got nothing left for a good encore. Yeah. Right. All, that pre, all that pretentious crap about, oh, we go off now so we can be called back. What a lot of bollocks. <laughs> okay? Thanks very much. All right, Mark. Take care. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.